Welcome to NHPR's U.S. Senate Debate. I'm Josh Rogers, senior political reporter for NHPR, joined today by Amanda Goki of New Hampshire Bulletin. These debates are produced in collaboration with the Bulletin and New Hampshire PBS. We're joined today by incumbent Democratic Senator Maggie Hassan and her challenger, Republican Don Bolduc. Welcome to you both. Thank Great you. to be here. Thank you. Thank you. As you can as you can divine, we do have a live audience here at NHPR, a bit about our format. Each candidate will have 60 seconds for an opening statement. We'll then move to questions. Candidates will have a minute to respond. Amanda and I may follow up or seek clarity. Candidates will get 30 seconds on those. And in the case of a direct attack, we'll be allowing candidates 30 seconds to respond. We've relied on the public's feedback in selecting today's topics and thank everyone who supplied input. We'll get started with opening statements. We did have a coin flip. General Bolduc, you're up first. I'm up first. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. It's my honor to be here. It's my honor to have the opportunity to represent Granite Staters in uh, Washington, D.C., and that's what I'll do. I'll represent you. I've been uh, campaigning for two years now, and I have been to every town and city in this state, and Granite Staters are hurting. They're making choices between heating and eating. Retirees are going back to work. Interest rates have doubled. What does that mean? That means that a $5,000 home two years ago, the mortgage would be $1,700. Today, that mortgage is now $2,700. Everything has doubled. Oil, gas, food, everything. And it's her fault. Her votes have driven this. And that's the problem we have. Career politicians who focus on special interests and lobbyists and uh, wealthy political elite. That must change. You need an outsider in Washington, D.C., and that is Don Baldick. Thank you. Thank you, General Senator. Well, I want to thank you, Josh and Amanda, for moderating and to NHPR and PBS and New Hampshire Bulletin for sponsoring today, to Don Baldick for participating, and for everybody who's here and tuning in, thanks for being part of this today. Every day, Granite Staters put aside their differences and work together to solve problems. And that is the approach that I've worked to follow in the United States Senate. I've worked across the aisle to expand high-speed internet to every community, to fix roads and bridges, to boost manufacturing, and to make sure that our veterans get the care and support that they have earned and deserve. I've also stood up to big oil and big pharma to take the steps necessary to begin lowering costs. I have a record of delivering for the people of New Hampshire, and I am proud to have been named the most bipartisan senator in the country. There's more work to do to build an economy that works for everyone. My focus will always be on listening to people in New Hampshire and delivering for the Granite State. Thank you. We're now going to turn to some economic issues. Amanda has some questions. So we're going to start with you, Senator Hassan. Many economists say increased government spending, much of which is, has been championed by Democrats, contributed to inflation over the past two years. You've said the Biden administration was slow to respond. Um, and so why should voters trust Democrats, including you, to address this in the, in the coming year? 60 seconds. So thanks for the question. So taking a step back, inflation is a global phenomenon. And most experts say that the labor shortage and the supply chain disruptions that are driving it are caused primarily by the pandemic and the war. Uh, so it's absolutely essential we do what we can right now to lower people's costs while also dealing with the long-term drivers of inflation. So that's why um, I passed a new law with other senators to allow Medicare to negotiate the cost of prescription drugs. We are already seeing that law go into effect. That helps people lower their costs right now. When it comes to energy costs, that's why I've pushed the Biden administration to release more home heating fuel right now from its reserves so that we can increase supply. We also uh, came together, and I led a bipartisan push to increase home heating assistance because right now these immediate costs are really hurting people. I also support suspending the gas tax, obviously. These are all things that Don Bolduc opposes. Uh, there's more to talk about with the Chips and Science Act and the bipartisan infrastructure bill and how they'll help us lower costs, too. So I want to talk a, a significant amount of government money went through the Paycheck Protection Program, mm -hmm. but there was plenty of PPP fraud with some estimates that as much as 10 to 15 percent of the funds or $80 billion were stolen. Is there a role for Congress to investigate this fraud? 
30 uh, seconds. Yes, there is. Now, I have talked with businesses all across New Hampshire who have uh, told me that the PPP program was a lifeline for them. Um, somebody, a small business owner this morning, just for example. So it was really important to keep businesses open. I also worked to make sure that businesses got a tax credit for keeping their employees on board during that time. But we also included in that law uh, critical oversight mechanisms, and we need to prosecute people who defrauded the government uh, to the full extent of the law. Energy prices are a major concern. You support suspending federal gas tax, but there's no guarantee that that would result in savings for people at the pump. How would a gas tax holiday really help consumers? Well, it would put more money in their pockets. Look, Shell Oil announced today that they made $9.5 billion in profits, the second highest profits that they have ever had. They are raking up profits along with other big oil companies while also jacking prices up at the pump. They are exploiting a war and a pandemic at the expense of granite staters. And here's the thing. My opponent stands right with big oil, says he would have opposed the new law we passed that will lower energy costs and help us pivot to a clean energy economy. So there's finally competition for big oil, a law that would give people tax breaks for making energy efficient investments in their homes right now. Don Bolduc opposes that, too. He has been standing with big oil rather than demanding that they increase the capacity that they have right now, thousands of untapped but permitted right. dr- wells. Um, and, you know, they well, could make they we'll, could help we'll lower let, we'll costs. We'll let Bolduc respond in a yeah. second. But, but um, why haven't you been more successful? I mean, you've been talking about this gas tax holiday for a long time. It, it, it clearly hasn't picked up enough traction to, to, be, to become reality. Why? Uh, Mitch McConnell blocked it on the Senate floor. We brought it to the Senate floor, um, and Mitch McConnell blocked it at about the same time that Republicans in New Hampshire blocked uh, the suspension of the state gas tax. Okay. General Baldock, we want to turn to you now. You have been criticizing your opponent on the issue of inflation, but the U.S. is not the only country experiencing this. Inflation is up on every continent, double digits in many places. So given this, how is it accurate to lay all of the blame on Democrats in Congress? Six seconds. I don't lay all the blame on Democrats. I say this is a Republican and a Democrat problem, which my opponent refuses to recognize. I'm going down there to represent Granite Staters who are hurting. And they're hurting because both parties are extreme. Both parties can't come together for the economy, out of control spending, and the safety and security of this nation. And most importantly, the people here. So, you know, let's be clear here. Let's make sure my words are understood. I mean, she's just thrown out several accusations that are all lies, right? I have never been a politician. She's ineffective. That's why we have these problems. She has not done the right thing for spending $5.2 trillion more trillion from March to August. This Medicaid thing that she, Medicare thing she talks about, that's great, but it doesn't go into effect until 2026. And it lowered prices for uh, insulin, which was great, but it took out Alzheimer's medication. How is that helping our elderly? It's not. It's double talk by career politicians who follow special interests, lobbyists, and wealthy political elite. And that's who they follow. They don't work for Granite Staters. They don't work for you. Check your electric bill. Let's talk a little bit about what you would do to address that issue. On your website, you say we must reverse the growth of federal spending spending to reduce inflation. Since you can't claw back the money that's already out the door, what future spending would you cut to address inflation? 30 seconds. Well, the first thing I would have done is voted for the for the bill that was put on the Senate floor in August that she voted against, and that was to stop any additional spending until we got inflation under control. She voted no for that, Okay. She talks about all these things about Don Baldick. Well, Don Baldick isn't in the Senate yet. Don Baldick will stop this spending, and I will work on common sense measures that help Granite Staters pay the bills, drive down gas prices, down food prices. She says she's been out talking to Granite Staters. She hasn't been out talking to Granite Staters. She's been like hiding how, from Granite How specifically Staters. would you drive down? Would you would you drive down inflation? How specifically? Yeah, how specifically? I would I mean, change all the energy policies that she has. Uh, agreed with with Biden. XL pipeline, more drilling, more permits, more leases. This doesn't empower the petroleum industry. It drops prices for you. It makes life affordable for you. She's got it all confused. Her so the, policies hurt people. The, My policies will reverse all of this and allow that inflation to come down. But like, where would you cut spending? I mean, that's the other part of this that I mean. OK, how about six million dollars going to New York? 
to build golf courses? How about $465,000 going to teach pigeons how to play slot machines? How about $7 million going to California to build parks? How about multi-millions of dollars going to Tunisia and Pakistan to, to study gender transition? That's their issue. That's not our issue. That's not your issue. How about, how about looking at all this pork that she adds to bills in order to be able to, to drive us into bankruptcy? How about putting a limit on the Fed and uh, printing money that we don't have? Constantly putting us in more and more debt, $5.2 trillion. You know what that did? Bottom line, that took $2 trillion out of people's retirement savings. $2 trillion. Think about that. Think about where your retirement savings are right now. The, three, the 401Ks are now 301Ks, 35% reduction in savings. The We're military is now to... on 401K retirement plans. And I hope we can get into talking about veterans because she pats herself on the back and there's a lot right, to we're, unravel We're going to be there. talking about a lot of things. And, and right now we're going to move to another question for you, General Bullock, um, regarding abortion. You say you oppose a federal abortion ban at, the, at a federal level. You said that consistently since the primary. Uh, but in Portsmouth recently, you said, quote, these other things, we've got to look into them. You were feeling a question related to in vitro fertilization. What other things were you referring to? Well, I have no idea because I don't have reference uh, to that. But bottom line is, and ma'am, I wish you would please listen to me because I can read your mask. I do not support, I do not support a federal ban either for or against abortion at the federal level. It is now a state issue, which she does not understand. I support New Hampshire's law. I support Granite Staters. She lies. I've told her this personally in several venues, and she continues to lie. Her commercials are hurtful. Her commercial about me wanting to murder mothers is disgraceful. It's disgraceful, and it brought my eight-year-old granddaughter to tears. I have worked my entire life to protect men and women and children, my entire life, and I will never, ever put anyone's life in jeopardy. These accusations are hurtful. She talks about working with people. She talks about wanting to get out there on the ground. Well, I've been out there on the ground. I know what these ads do. I know what these lies do. Lying about Social Security, okay, we're lying move, about everything. We're talking about abortion right now. We're going to move to the center abortion. house in a moment. I've got one. I've no got one. ban. Support the state law. I will always do that. So no, no role line. for the federal government on any issue touching. No, the... no, no, no. And I've told Mitch McConnell and I've told Lindsey Graham. Okay, Senator, you argue abortion should be a private decision between a woman and her doctor. Do you see any role for the federal government to play in, in regulating abortion, or, or should this be a state matter? Um, let's just take a step back for a minute because there's been a lot said over the last couple of minutes about a huge number of issues. But let me talk about abortion, and then I hope to have the opportunity to talk about a couple of the other things that Don Boldick is, frankly, misleading people about. Uh, this is about a woman's fundamental freedom, her health, and her safety. Uh, and Don Boldick has a very long record of extremism here. He said on the campaign trail that he would never vote against anti-choice legislation in the United States Senate. That means he is a yes vote for a na national abortion ban. And people can go to uh, BoldickFacts.com and see the videos of Don Boldick saying these things. Um, he said that we should rejoice when Dobbs overturned Roe v. Wade. The women of New Hampshire are not rejoicing. Uh, and when we have pushed him on this, first he told the women of New Hampshire to get over it. Then he said that oh, gentlemen in the state legislature should make these decisions for us. Um, the problem with politicians like Don Baldick drawing okay, Senator, arbitrary but, lines – I'm but, getting to your question for just a second uh, – arbitrary lines – um, in terms of these decisions is that they can, in fact, harm women and cost them their lives in some cases. But so do you believe, though, that the, that, the, that the government should play any role in the regulation of abortion, period? I believe that when the government tries to do that, it can cost women their lives, as we have seen in some states. And I think it is very, very concerning uh, that people don't trust women and their doctors to do to make these very complex and often tragic decisions together. But, you know, you, you were one of the sponsors of the Women's Health Protection Act, which leaves the door open for states to limit abortion after viability. So, so you see that as something that, that states should be able to do? I, I, I am a sponsor of that law. I support that law. Uh, it would be my preference that neither 
legislators in the United States Senate uh, nor in uh, state legislatures substitute their judgment in complex, difficult decisions for women and their doctors. I also think it's really important that we allow doctors to do their jobs without fear of criminal prosecution. All right, we're going to move on, Amanda. Thanks, Josh. Let's turn to climate, something we've heard from a lot of voters about. Senator Hassan, the Inflation Reduction Act was the federal government's biggest piece of climate legislation to date. What do you believe needs to be done next to address climate change? 60 seconds. Well, the new law that we passed uh, will help in the short term lower home efficient home energy costs by giving people a tax cut for investing in home energy efficiency. It also has a lot of provisions, as you know, to promote investment into a clean energy economy so we can finally see uh, competition to big oil and we can pivot to a clean energy economy. And since climate change is a huge issue, I hear about it uh, from small businesses on the seacoast seeing increased sea level rise and facing flooding. I see it and hear about it from the travel and tourism industry here in New Hampshire and from homeowners. So it's really important that these measures are estimated to result in about a 40 percent reduction in carbon emissions by 2030. Uh, there are also, by the way, uh, resources available to people right now to invest in weatherization in their home, to get assistance for weatherization in their homes as we're facing high heating uh, costs, high energy costs, and trying to deal with climate change all at once. Uh, there are a number of next steps, but I think the most important thing is we've taken this major step. We're seeing investment already coming into the clean energy sector, and American innovation uh, can, all, can now really be tapped to tackle this major problem. So Democrats and Republicans don't typically see eye to eye on climate. What does bipartisan climate policy look like, and how would you personally go about bridging that gap? Yeah. Well, so I just talked about one of the uh, bipartisan measures that made it into this new law. It's something I worked on with Senator Collins in Maine. It's the measure that I talked about that gives people a tax credit if they invest in home energy efficiency. You know that Senator Shaheen and Senator Portman have long worked on bipartisan energy efficiency measures because we know the lack of energy efficiency in much of our built infrastructure is one of the major contributions to carbon emissions. So that's another example of the kind of work we have been able to do across work across the aisle. And uh, Senator Portman and Senator Shaheen uh, were successful in Thank including you. that that measure, too. Thank you. Now to you, General Baldock. Yes, ma'am. You've said you're concerned about the environment and that mm -hmm. American businesses should be held accountable for air and water pollution. Mm -hmm. Do you believe the government should establish binding targets when it comes to reducing emissions? I think the federal government involved in this business is a complete waste of money and a waste of time. I think the federal, I think the state government should do it. I think our state legislatures and our governors will take care of our environment really well. And I think that the uh, EPA at the federal level has established uh, standards that, uh, that the state doesn't agree with for our water, 17, 70 parts per million versus 13 to 15 parts per million, right? The federal, what she talks about, I, you know, I support anything to help the environment. I think it's great. I'm all over that. But what they're not doing and everything that they are doing with the Green New Deal is hurting Granite Staters. They're, they're taking away fossil fuel, which they need in order to be able to make renewable energy. They're costing you way more money. This is the deal. The deal is you pay for something. They charge you for it. There, there's, no, there's no goodness in that for you. And how about China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, the biggest polluters in the world? She's got nothing to say about that. They're the biggest polluters in the world. America does a great job and will continue to do a great job for our environment and our climate. And I will be a champion for that. But she doesn't hold any of the other countries that are polluting. While, while Russia is not held accountable, she's holding American businesses accountable and running them out of business. That's how, would you, how would you hold Russia and other polluting com countries accountable? Well, I would, I would demand the same kind of, uh, the same kind of international uh, agreements that, they, that, that, is, uh, that we, ha we are bound by. I mean, come on, they dump plastic and all kinds of pollutants in our oceans every single day without any accountability from our U.S. Senate. They don't hold anyone accountable. They haven't. They didn't hold them accountable for Afghanistan. Look what's going on there. Ukraine, look what's going on there. You know, war is one of the biggest environmental polluters. I know that. I will work to keep us out of war. China, look what they're doing in Asia. They're polluting Asia all over the place inside the, the, the South China, China Sea and everything. We're not doing anything about that. 
General, I wanted to ask That's you. That's the problem. We're Bunch of get political the double talk up here to make you feel good. But the bottom line is we're not holding the people accountable that we need to hold accountable. And we're blaming ourselves and making you pay for it. We're going to get to foreign things in a moment. One more, I, one more question I on the environment to, to you, General, from Amanda. You call for energy independence. So beyond drilling, how would you accomplish that? How would I accomplish energy independence? Correct. The XL pipeline. The expansion of... But beyond drilling, what other... Or do you think that drilling is sufficient? Well, I think exploration is sufficient. I think that that uh, the drilling, everything that they reversed that put us in this spot is what needs to be addressed because it has got us here, and they reinforce failure every day. I don't know how she can look granite staters in the eyes knowing that they're making a choice between heating and eating. I've been out there holding the hands of moms and dads and retirees who can't afford to live right now a family who was moved out of their home because they can't afford their home into a three-room apartment with their three children. Okay, we've got to This move. is disgraceful. It's wrong. We're it's her move. fault. All right, we're going to move on to foreign policy. Um, General, you've criticized U.S. foreign policy for being too reactive under right. Joe Biden. What are some specific examples of what you think the country should be doing differently? Well, first of all, we can't do anything when we're economically weak. Listen. Military strategy, policy, national security is based off of strong diplomacy. We are not respected in the world, largely because of decisions made by the Biden administration with the withdrawal from Afghanistan and doing nothing and sitting back and watching Russia invade Ukraine and then do nothing in, in, in the times of lull to bring people to the dip, uh, diplomatic table. Our politics is weak because our economy is weak, because we have policies that weaken that. And that's the Democrats' fault. That's her fault. That's the administration's fault. You can't have a strong military. Our military is rated as weak now, a downgrade from marginal. Our informational policy, people don't trust us when we talk anymore because of what we did in Afghanistan. They don't believe us. Our values and principles have been undermined. And they've been undermined by her and the Democratic Party and some Republicans, and it's unfortunate, and we need a change. So, General, you mentioned Ukraine a moment ago, and over the course of, uh, the, you know, over the course of recent months, you've said a number of things regarding the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You voiced support for putting boots on the ground in the form of the CIA. In April, you said President Zelensky needed material support. You also said last month that funding should be cut because the U.S. has no mission there. Um, so kind of which is it? Where? What should no. the U.S. do now? Originally, we should have thrown every deterrent at them that we could have originally, before, months before, but we didn't do it. So then we needed to do that. And then we were stuck. So what are we going to do? We're going to build up the resistance. We did that. And then before we even finished the first package of relief, she approved another $40 billion. I wouldn't have done that. I would have required transparency to the American people on why we're going to add another $40 billion, and then another $40 billion. And instead of bringing Putin to the table when there was a lull in fighting, they just watched him do it, and then he comes back, and he comes back with missiles and, you know, killing women and children. Their fault. They did nothing because our diplomacy and our politics are weak. Our military Well, what should we do now, answer. though? What should we do now? What should we do now? Well, it's simple, right? We should be turning off Putin's ability to get any energy, shutting that off. That's his lifeline. That's the center of gravity for him. And if we cut that off, the Russian people in the Politburo will say enough is enough and we'll bring him to the table. That's what we have to do. Sending the, eight, the 101st Airborne Division over there and putting him in Romania, one step away from conventional boots on the ground, when we have an administration that can't even do a withdrawal properly. We want them to get into a conventional war in Ukraine against Russia. Is that what you want? Because that's exactly what's going to happen under her. What has she said about that? Zip. Nothing. She's been absent. You know, you want me to have all the solutions, and I have solutions for, for military okay, well, strategy what would, what would, what, how would you, She's well, there doing yeah, nothing. We're going to get to her in a second, but what, what would you do if, 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 uh, if Putin used a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine? How should the U.S. respond in that circumstance? If he uses a tactical nuclear weapon, yeah. then he has probably, you know, first of all, 
He's going to threaten that. It's on the table, right? Mutual assured destruction on the table. Uh, China is pulling the strings here, and China wants to lead the world. And they're, and they're well on their way to doing it because we've weakened ourselves so much economically, politically, diplomatically, militarily. We've let them into every one of our institutions. We're allowing them to buy farmland right up next to our strategic bases. This is unbelievable. Okay, I want to talk All about under her. No, no, let me, you well, asked me the okay, question. Okay, well, what, what, so what to do about a nuclear if, yeah. if he's... So you've got to put pressure on China because China's pulling the strings. China does not want to inherit a post-nuclear world. And so they will keep him in check. But we have to do it, too, in sitting back saying, well, it's up to Putin. That's their strategy. Okay. That's what okay, the Democrats Senator. do. Oh, it's up to Putin. Well, right. no, it's up to us to lead. And we're not leading because we're weak. Okay, Senator, what, what do you say to that critique? Um, look, there are a lot of things that have been said over the last multiple minutes on a bunch of different issues. Let me just start by saying that when Don Bolduc was talking about energy several minutes ago, he was apologizing yet again for big oil and singing their song. Let me also just say that he has consistently stood with big oil and did not give you, Amanda, a straight answer because, of course, big oil could be increasing their capacity and lowering prices at the okay. pump right now, and they are choosing not to. And that's why I've called for an investigation to investigate their price gouging and manipulation. Don Baldick makes excuses for a lot of big corporate special interests, big pharma being the I other one. I want to get to Ukraine. I, do, I, want, I want to get to that, too. But I also really do need to be able to have the opportunity to correct the record and let people understand how extreme and how aligned with big corporate interests my opponent is. Now, okay. on to Ukraine. Um, well, Ukrainian, you, Bob, let me just ask a question. Yeah. I mean, you voted for billions of dollars of military aid. Um, you know, what do you make of U.S. strategy there? And should there be a clear limit on this country's support in Ukraine? So the Ukrainian people are giving their lives for what we have, democracy. They are demonstrating at enormous personal risk and with enormous bravery um, and courage that democracies are worth fighting for. Vladimir Putin is a war criminal. He has to be held accountable. There has been bipartisan support for making sure that we follow a strategy that does two things. We make sure that Ukraine has the resources, both in terms of weapon, expertise, training, and finances to work to repel Vladimir Putin and stand up for their democracy. We also have a strategy of imposing significant sanctions on Putin that have had serious effect and have crippled his ability to prosecute what is an unconscionable war. At the end of the day, we have to be able to assess facts on the ground and make decisions about next steps accordingly with our allies. One of the things that we have done successfully is build a strong alliance. It is absolutely critical we have partners in the region um, so that we can let Vladimir, not only Putin, but the other world's autocrats, China, Iran, and North Korea, see that we will fight for democracy so that uh, democracies can survive. Well, should the U.S. encourage Ukraine to, to give up territory to secure peace? The Ukrainian people have a right to self-determination, and that is their decision to make. We should do everything we can to foster uh, diplomacy um, at the Ukrainian people's request. Um, it's obviously important that we reach peace, um, that Ukraine reaches peace uh, as soon as it can, because nobody likes war. But we do also have to support a democracy that is struggling to repel a war criminal. And I am proud of the fact that there has been bipartisan consensus in the Senate and in Congress uh, to make sure that we are standing with people who are standing for freedom and repelling Putin before his aggression can move further. Okay, we're going to move on now. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit now about immigration. Senator Hassan, you've supported a Trump era policy called Title 42 that lets the federal government turn away asylum seekers at the border. That public health measure is meant to stop the spread of infectious disease, but we're now at a different stage in the pandemic. Is this still an appropriate way to address the issue? Well, what I have said, because the first job of government is to keep its people safe, and that starts, among other things, with a safe, secure, and orderly border so that we can also have 
a country that enforces the rule of law and lives up to our values, that the Biden administration should not prematurely lift Title 42. There's consensus that when Title 42 is lifted, there will be a surge of migration. Uh, we have to make sure that we can keep people from crossing the border illegally and that we can fight drug and human trafficking, right? So knowing, and there's really bipartisan consensus that when Title 42 is lifted, there will be a surge of migration. We have to know that we have the security resources at the border to deal with that surge. I have traveled multiple times to the border uh, talking with frontline personnel, and they don't have the resources they need to have the kind of operational security uh, that would be required. So they need more personnel, they mean, need more technology, and in some cases they need more physical barriers. And that's why I have pushed back hard against the administration's plan to lift this Title 42 prematurely because security has to be our priority. So immigrant rights activists in New Hampshire have say this policy is, is racist. Are they wrong? We have to have a secure border so that we can run an asylum um, adjudication system uh, that honors our values. But the first job of government is to keep people safe. And right now, we don't have enough uh, court, uh, Custom Border Patrol agents at the border. I have voted to provide significantly more there. We don't have enough technology, not only to detect human smuggling, uh, but also to detect drug smuggling, especially fentanyl and the new synthetic opioids. We have some new technology that does that, but not enough. And in some cases, uh, there are gaps in physical barriers that should be closed so that we can give our frontline personnel what they need. Okay, thank you. I want to turn to General Baldock mm -hmm. now. You call for securing the borders and adding more border agents, mm -hmm. but employers around the country are struggling to fill vacancies, including industries that rely on migrant workers. What changes in immigration policy would you support to address this problem? Well, First of all, I would uh, immediately want to enforce our legal immigration, right, which we're not doing right now, thanks to the Democratic Party and the policies of Joe Biden. She just talked about Title 42. Well, she just voted to lift it on the Senate floor. So she don't want to keep it in place. She just voted to lift it. It's a matter of record on the Senate floor. So what are we talking about there? She voted against everything President Trump wanted to do to secure the but border. I want to hear about what you would do. In what terms do you mean of what I would do? I'm telling you what policy. I would do. I would secure the border. I would secure it. 87,000 IRS agents? No way. 80 billion to fund that? No way. Needs to go to the Border Patrol. She voted for 600 agents. They're at 19,000. They need 25,000. They don't have the equipment they need. They're trying to manage a border. They're hurting the northern border and every other port of entry with their policies. They're weakening us all across this country. Five million people have come to this country, and they've come through unlawfully, and they haven't been adjudicated right, and they've been dumped on our communities, costing us billions of dollars, crime, opioid crisis, all these things. You have to secure the border, and you have to do it with a good, strong border patrol, and you have to do it with good immigration law. And the signal that's being sent is causing all kinds of people. She said she cares about women and children. Do you know the trek they have to take? Murder, rape, do you know that is inhumane? I know that. I worked on borders. I've seen it. I've held babies. I've held mothers. I've held people that have been assaulted. I have seen it personally. I know what these policies have given us. But so and this, think... aren't, um, this isn't American values. This is the exact opposite of American values. And it needs to stop. But do you think sealing the border Visiting more effectively with general? Visiting the border is a general... whole heck of a lot different than working on borders. Do you think sealing the border more effectively will deter people from making the, that, that track you described? There's two messages here, and it's all informational. We have a legal immigration system, not open immigration system, and we have a border that will be sealed, and you will remain in Mexico. And that did work under the last administration because we got other countries involved. Now it's willy-nilly throw everybody at our southern border coming north from all kinds of countries. Never mind how many terrorists are here. Look how she's empowered the cartel with opioids and human trafficking and weapons trafficking. We're running Look up at what's going our... up here. Look what's going on here in this state. 200% take... increase in the opioid crisis. We can revisit some of these. We're going to take a break sure. right now. Got we'll it. stick around for uh, NHPR's candidate debate. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Thank, Thank you. you.
Welcome back to NHPR's U.S. Senate debate in collaboration with the New Hampshire Bulletin and New Hampshire PBS. We're talking with incumbent Democratic Senator Maggie Hassan and Republican Don Bullock. I'm Josh Rogers, NHPR's senior political reporter. With me is Amanda Gokey of New Hampshire Bulletin. We'll continue now with a discussion on voting and elections. General, uh, this week, you know, earlier, a couple of days ago, you said yesterday, I think, you said you'd accept the results of next month's vote, you know, regardless of how it went for you. Referring to, but last week, referring to the 2020 election, you said, quote, I still believe there were irregularities and fraud, and I believe that can be proven even in this state. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no evidence of widespread fraud in New Hampshire. The governor and the secretary of state both say New Hampshire elections are secure and not compromised by fraud. Do you believe they're wrong? 60 seconds. Well, I believe Granite's daters, right? And I'm the only one sitting here that's been in every town and city in this state over two years. And I believe Granite Staters when they say they don't like the fact that college students that aren't residents here can vote. They don't like the fact that they can't trust the mail-in ballot system. They don't like the fact that there was proven irregularities with voting machines that haven't been certified in 20 years. They don't like the fact that same-day voter registration causes fraud. If Granite Staters don't like it, then we need to take a look at it. But what she believes in is federalizing the process. I don't believe in that at all. More big government. That's all she's been talking about. Big government. Not only does she believe in federalizing that, but she wants to take away our electoral college that would hurt New Hampshire. She voted for that in SB1. She can't hide from that. That's her vote. And that would also take first in the state primary away. Something that brings about four billion dollars every four years to the people of New Hampshire. We're going we're to get to some of that. This in, is in huge. We, okay, we're going right? to get to some of that in a moment. So this General. is huge. So I listen to Granite Staters. I don't want the federal government in your business. All right, we're going to get to that. I, I do have a follow-up though. You mentioned you want to eliminate same-day voter registration in New Hampshire. No, I want the state to look at it. Okay, well, this is what you said get, yesterday. Get, yeah. okay, okay, I want so, the so state you, to look at okay, it. I we, want our state legislators and governors to look at it because the Heritage Foundation found that we ranked 21, 21 in voter integrity. All right, let me just get to 50. the question here, though. The question is, is that if you eliminate that, um, then New Hampshire would need to follow so-called motor voter requirements federally, which would essentially have voters register any time they got a driver's license. Is that something that you favor? No, you can balance that. And again, the federal government needs to stay out of elections at the state level. And these are all laws that have to be relooked. But right? that's what same-day registration does for New Hampshire. We're one of the small states that got well, waivers from. Well, then we from... need to make sure that school buses loaded with people at the polls don't come in and vote. And we need to make sure... We need to make sure that the 10,000 people that show up on same day without an ID card actually come back and prove. 10,000 people, less than 400 came back. You can laugh about it, but people in New Hampshire aren't laughing about it. This is a fundamental freedom that I was sent to other countries to make sure happened. And you know what? The Congress has rules when we help other countries. They have to have an ID. They have to prove where they live inside that country. They, they can't do it same day. This is all rules that we apply to other countries. Okay, General, we're going to move to the center. You can shake your heads all like, you want, but the bottom line is that's, that's what it is. But just to be clear, you're, saying, you're claiming that buses full of voters who are not permitted to vote here, you're claiming that that happens in New Hampshire? I am claiming that that is what Granite Staters tell me. And I am saying we need to respond to that. Do you because think we need to verify that information before I you I think say. we need to verify it. That's what I just said. Can you... Can you listen to me here for a second? I am saying that this is what Granite Staters are telling me, and I think it's valid, okay. and I believe right. in it. You think it's valid. Okay. I think it's valid. Okay. Senator, you praise the way New Hampshire administers elections, but you also have supported uh, you know, some of the things that the, the general invoked, the For the People Act. That is a sweeping federal law that would require early voting, expand voting by mail. It would eliminate voter ID requirements, among many other things, but those provisions would override local election laws. So. If New Hampshire's elections are well run in your estimation, why would the state be well served by those changes? Well, first of all, New Hampshire does have some of the best elections in the country, and some of the provisions of that law make exceptions for small states like ours. Happy to follow up with you. But look, what you just heard from Don Boldick is his continued attempt to stoke the big lie. He has traveled around this state for 
over a year now, Two years. Um, stoking the big lie that 2020 was stolen. Uh, he has said he's been Sorry. casting doubt on whether this election is something uh, that he will accept uh, by suggesting even last week that there would be big ballot dumps uh, election night. He has said that as a senator, if the 2024 election doesn't go for his preferred candidate, he would work to overturn the election. Here's the thing about election deniers, right? He is working and has been working to conceal how extreme he is on everything from eliminating Social Security, uh, enacting a nationwide abortion ban, and being right, an al- and being an, al- to, and being an al- stick to election laws. Right well, now. excuse me, I've I've listened to him talk about a lot of different issues, and here's the reason why having free and fair elections matters. It is because it is the way people in New Hampshire hold us accountable. Don Baldick can al- ignore where most Granite Staters are on those issues that I just talked about, right, because he thinks he doesn't need to accept election results. It means he doesn't think he is accountable, and he is promoting an agenda, Josh, that would raise people's costs. We haven't even talked about his proposal to do a 23 percent sales tax on everything, including rent rent and health care, and— um, eviscerate people's okay. rights. That's but, why this oh is no, relevant. Like, That's why this okay, is but, relevant. I mean, I, we can hear it here. There okay. obviously is a big partisan gap that is obvious when it comes to election laws. Republicans Huge. tend to focus on tightening laws in the name of guarding against right. fraud. Yes. Democrats prioritize making it easier to vote. What are specific ways you believe that there's common ground that could be reachable? On these well, issues? I hope we can find common ground here. It has been very hard to do. Um, free and fair elections are the, act- the hallmark and foundation of our democracy. And when they are eroded because people think they can deny elections or when they can undermine elections uh, with partisans overturning election results, which is one of the things that the Freedom to Vote Act tries to address, then our democracy erodes and it gets very hard to get it back. So I have supported the Freedom to Vote Act that makes sure that we have, for instance, bipartisan, uh, nonpartisan, sorry, commissions to do redistricting. Okay, uh, I think that's something most. Yeah. yeah okay. uh, no. So I, I would think that the Republican Party would join with us on wanting nonpartisan redistricting. They have okay, rejected we're gonna, that. We're gonna, okay. We're going to move yep. on. Yep. And discuss a related topic of government reform. Okay. Yep. I want to move on to talk about potential structural reforms to how things work in Washington. Let's start with the filibuster. Senator Hassan, last year you backed ending the Senate filibuster to make it easier to pass a sweeping election overhaul bill that we've just been discussing. Are there other circumstances when you'd go around the filibuster? And why not just get rid of it entirely? <clears throat> Uh, Look, the filibuster rule, which I think most viewers and listeners know about, is a rule that is intended to incentivize senators to come together and find that common ground that I've talked about. Uh, I'm proud of having been ranked the most bipartisan senator in the country because I've really focused on how you find common ground on any number of wide range of issues. Now, the problem with the filibuster as it is currently used is that it has gone from what we call the talking filibuster when a senator who wanted to block legislation from being voted on had to take the Senate floor and explain to the country why they were blocking this legislation. It's now gotten to a point where a senator with the push of an email button can just block legislation. So you'd be without... in favor of returning so to that? I have been in favor of returning it to a talking filibuster, right? Um, I also think that there are some issues that are so fundamental to our democracy, like the right to vote or like a woman's right to make her own health care decisions, uh, that we shouldn't allow um, a, a minority of the Senate to block those rights. Thank you. Thank you. General Bulldog, same question to you. Do you see any circumstances in which you'd support doing away with the filibuster? No, I do not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Hassan, let's move to the courts. Do you think it's time to end lifetime appointments to federal courts? I think, like many Granite Staters, I have been very concerned about the politicization of the United States Supreme Court, of justices who've been appointed saying that they would respect precedent, for instance, uh, in the area of reproductive freedom, and then didn't. Uh, And I think that concerns all Americans. Um, I have listened to a number of proposals, um, and uh, one of the proposals that I think might make sense is to um, put a 
uh, limit on years of service on the Supreme Court to justices while they could still then serve in other federal on other federal uh, benches um, so that we could have a predictable um, rotation of justices. What about term limits for senators and members of Congress? I think voters can decide whether we are term limited. And I think it's really important for voters to have the choice to decide that they like what somebody's been doing and they want them to continue in service. Uh, they can also uh, obviously vote us out of office. I mean, the, General Bullock already mentioned it, Senator, but but uh, you back getting rid of the Electoral College in the wake of the 2016 elections. Do you think that's a good thing that serves a small state like New Hampshire? Um, First of all, it would require a constitutional amendment, no, and it is very unlikely to happen, right? You, so, you favored it then. So what my concern is, is an increasing um, kind of minority hold um, on popular elections. But let's be really clear. New Hampshire has two senators despite its size, right? Uh, New Hampshire will continue always to have the first in the nation primary, something well, I'm we'll a vigorous see. advocate for. Um, no, we, we have a law that says we'll go first, we'll go first, and we make better candidates and better presidents, and it's good for the country. Okay, let's turn, well, let's turn to the general on this. I mean, where, where are you, uh, where would you be on um, when getting rid of the Electoral College? You think that's a good thing for New Hampshire? Senator I would never seems- support that. Um, General Baldock, I know you support term limits for members of Congress. Do you think there should be term limits for federal judges also? I do not support the term limits for uh, the uh, Supreme Court. No, at this time I do not. Do you think it's worth expanding the Supreme Court? No, I do not. All right, we're going to move on. Um, you know, I want to turn to the – some of this has been on display here today, but I want to turn to the, the kinds of campaigns you two have run in this race. Um, you know, Senator Hassan, um, for much of the past, you know, several years, really, uh, General Bullock has been running a very public campaign, lots of open events, takes lots of questions from whoever shows up. Uh, your approach has relied on a more tightly controlled approach uh, where events are often effectively private. Um, and I've heard you say many times that you believe we do democracy better in New Hampshire than anywhere else. Has, how's the candidate, how the campaign that you've chosen to run reflect that? I'm out and about talking to Granite Staters all the time. I have lots of events uh, at businesses where I sit down with employees, uh, listen to their concerns. Uh, I shop at Market Basket. I go to Dunkin' Donuts. I hear a lot from Granite Staters, both positive and negative. Uh, And um, look, uh, I think the real issue here is what my record reflects in terms of addressing the issues that Granite Staters prioritized. So it was Granite Staters who came to me and said they were paying hundreds and thousands of dollars in extra health care costs because of surprise medical billing. I teamed up with a Republican. We've now banned that nationwide, saving people on their health care costs. Granite Staters told me how much we need to fix our roads and bridges and to get high-speed internet to every community. So I teamed up with Republicans and Democrats. We negotiated the infrastructure law and we have delivered. Um, so you don't think people opioid, should view? The but you opioid don't, crisis. So this is a question about yeah, your campaign yeah. style, though. This is—I mean—so well, you don't I'll, think I'll that look, you don't think people, that this is a reflection of politics of our time? But it's not as sort of free and open. And oh, we do it best in New Hampshire, and we were always going to be first, and everyone gets. I mean, it hasn't been that way. Well, look, you, you are a political commentator. I am not. I run my campaign in a way that allows me to hear from Granite Staters and address their concerns in real time, both as a candidate and as a sitting United States senator. Okay, General, I want to turn to you. You know, you obviously stress that you're a political outsider and you have today and all campaign long uh, endeavored to deride Senator Hassan as a career politician. But, you know, on plenty of issues from accepting the results of the 2020 election to abortion to how you see the future of entitlement programs, you know, your stances have been seemingly a little different depending on your audience, depending on who you're talking to. Um, you know, how is that a departure from the kind of politics as usual you say voters are frustrated with and want to end? Look, here's the deal. I made clear how I feel on abortion, right? And now I'm going to make it clear on how I feel on Social Security. I never said, ever did I say that I was going to terminate Social Security. I will protect it and I will make sure that it endures and I will do what what – I will make sure that they get stolen from, like they have stolen from it. And I will protect Medicare, and I will make it easier, and I will make it more affordable. I will get rid of the donut hole, which, you know what that is, right? If you're in Medicare, you know what it is, because I hear from a lot of grand staters. The more care you need, the more expensive it gets. But I mean, on, on, so on, on this the is the problem, okay. right? And so the more people that you talk to, 
the more experience you get and the more ideas that you get and the more views that you need to internalize. So it's not changing for audience sake. It's changing because that's what I'm supposed to be, accountable, responsible, transparent, trustful, tell the truth, admit when I'm wrong. And I've admitted that I got it wrong on the 2020 election. She hasn't admitted that she was a 2016 election denier, but she was. So that's the difference. Fundamental difference is I account, right? She does not. I believe we have integrity issues in our, in our elections. She denies it and wants to federalize it and make it more problematic. See, I am out there talking to people. I am a granite stater. I came from this state. I was born and raised in this state. I worked the ground in this state as a farmer, as a police officer. Served 33 and a half years for this country. Lost okay. 72 service members right, in Senator. battle. This is, my, this is my approach. No, okay. it's my approach. As a general officer, I worked for people. I did not Okay, well, make we're going to give, we're gonna give Senator House a chance to respond what to, what, to, to, to what yeah. you said. And then give me a chance. So, I wish we had more time. <laughs> Um, look, people can watch videos for themselves at bolduckfacts.com. Which is when, her website. Well, come on. It, it has videos of General Bolduck talking. That have been tampered with. Please stop Oh, my interrupt. goodness. So let's... I'm just let's, telling you. I think what's happened here is that Don Bolduck, whose views are very extreme and very out of step with Granite Staters has discovered that. And so he works to conceal it from people, as he has throughout this debate today. He has said that he wants to get rid of the Social Security program just a few weeks ago, saying on camera to a news reporter, it's been around since 1935, it's time for a change. He has oh. said that privatizing Medicare and making at least a trillion dollars of cuts to it, is a priority of his. Oh, That's on video, too. He has supported a 23% sales tax on rent, health care, no, everything no. else, um, and he doesn't want people to know about it because he knows it's not something Granite Staters would support. What do you mean by the 20%? Yeah, really, I'd he, like he, to know, too. He supports something called the Fair Tax Program, and that is a 23% sales tax, regardless of your income, um, on uh, everything you purchase, including rental and health care. He has supported that right, well, throughout his time in office. Is a fair tax something, something? Yeah. I'm no, I never said that. He, and if you, I did, you just, you'd have it written down well, in your notes. He just supported it on Facebook Live this week with Adam Sexton, okay? So let's just talk about um, what's really happening here, which I is now... Okay, we're going to move our I tax think, it, Amanda, you wanted to talk about government, you know... Well, I think we're going to move to environmental okay. regulation. Okay, but so good. Gets in. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, we're going to start with you, General Bulldog. You've talked about your own exposure to chemicals and drinking mm -hmm. nasty water during your time in the military. What role should the government play in regulating PFAS and other chemicals that can be harmful to human health? Well, I think it's obvious, right? They should they should make sure that corporations don't do it. And I think our state should should be the ones in charge of that. And I think they will do it very, very effectively. And I think that at the federal level, we need to we need to give block grants to fire departments and others to buy new equipment so that they can be safe from their equipment that's made with PFAS and they can be safe from all these chemicals. That's what we should be doing. We should be making sure at the federal level that they can do this and we let the states make sure that the water and the air and everything is clean. Under her model, the federal government does it all and it's a wasteful model. It costs us more money and the uh, regulations are different. It's more strict here, it's less strict at the federal level. But people, but the companies will default to the federal level because they can, and that's wrong, and that's what we shouldn't do. The environment is important to me, right? And she's going to talk about the PACT Act, right? And I think that's a great act, but there's only 50,000 people waiting, and it's not funded, and the VA doesn't even know how they're going to implement it. That's the problems we have when the federal government does things in a bureaucratic way and then pats themselves on the back for thinking they're solving a problem when they're creating more problems. That's the problem. Senator Hassan, we want to give you a chance to respond to that. Well, so, look, I hear about environmental concerns from Granite Staters all the time. 
uh, especially when it comes to PFAS contamination of our drinking water, uh, contamination we've seen obviously around the Pease Air Force Base and also over in Merrimack, and we see it in other parts of the state as well. It's why in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, we allotted a specific amount of money nationally, $2 billion, I think it was, it may have been more, uh, for uh, decontamination of PFAS sites. And New Hampshire is seeing some of that money uh, come to it right now. Now, that's a bill that Don Baldick says uh, he would have voted against. Um, we know that the EPA has now defined PFAS as a hazardous substance that will help us get more resources to that cleanup. And yes, we do need to continue to work with fire departments and first responders uh, to help them with new, new equipment and ultimately get a new kind of firefighting foam that doesn't have PFAS in it. All right, we're really running out of time here, but quickly, 10 seconds each. I know this is a tough one, but it, you know, depending on who, regardless of who wins, like how would you, how would you, if you, if you, if you get reelected senator, how would you work to reach out to people who didn't vote for you? Obviously, there are great divides in this country. Uh, I, I always look forward to talking with Granite Staters, and I will continue to travel around, do forums, as I have been, chambers of commerce, uh, talking with people everywhere I go. Okay. What about you, General? I've done 60 town halls. I invite everybody to those town halls, and everybody comes, Democrats, independents, libertarians, free staters. I welcome the challenge. I welcome the questions. You will be treated with respect, and I will make sure that I listen and learn from you. Okay, I can hear the music swell. That concludes our debate today. I want to thank both of you, Senator Hass and General Bolduck, for taking part. Thank you to New Hampshire PBS. Thank you for Amanda for being here to ask questions. We're going to be um, debating tomorrow at noon for the candidates for the second congressional district. For now, I'm Josh Rogers with Amanda Gokey. Thank you very much for joining us today on NHPR. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you.